Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 130, the podcast where we talk about photography, videography, and anything that's got anything to do with any of that. That being said, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, be reminded that there's a fully fledged, fully technicolored version over on YouTube, if you're so inclined. Anyway, in today's episode, we have another awesome guest. It is the creative director, photographer, retoucher, compositor, artificial intelligence expert, father to a cat called Miss Scraggles, and Krispy Kreme aficionado. Give it up for Micah Burke. Micah, man, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Awesome. So uh, we've just we've just discovered that actually you're in an area of California that I know reasonably well. Yeah, I live. I live in. I actually live in the Central Valley in a place called Stockton, but I, I work and uh, do a lot of commuting into a place called Livermore, which is a, a beautiful little valley with uh, wineries and uh, uh, you know upscale food restaurants and that sort of thing. So, uh, but I do a lot of my photography between Livermore and the, the Central Valley. There's this, this little stretch of road which is just gorgeous, and I can get a hundred different angles of the same sunset, and it's pretty awesome up there. Yeah, it's. I've been admiring your landscape photography, which is. <laughs> fantastic um it's it has like a fantasy feel to it almost yeah several years ago i took a class through um uh, trey radcliffe had a, a system set up where you could interview and, and work with mentors and i was working with a photographer named karen hutton and sort of developed sort of this fantasy style that she really liked and, and the sort of adopted and I don't have a lot of time to work on it anymore because I've got so much other things going on with AI and, and Adobe Max and that sort of stuff. But um, when I do photography, when I do my photography, I kind of like to add a little bit of art, art to it. Um, I'm not a journalistic photographer in any way, shape, or form. I, I like to uh, I like to play with my photos a lot, and uh, I don't have any problem with with anybody doing that. Yeah, it's you know it's this thing um, I think because there's this this sort of old school uh, of thinking of like you got to get it right in camera, and I, you know. I say this all the time on this podcast, and and um, you know when I uh, when I hold, when I do talks, for instance, I, I try to bring that across. Is that you know, it's it's a little bit like a guitar and an amplifier, you know, an electric guitar and an amplifier. Like the the one one thing on its own doesn't make a lot of sense, but once you put them together, that's where the power lies, you know. And uh, indeed, and so, indeed. And I, I think you know, post production is one of these things where um, where you can really not only bring a photo to life, but but really change the meaning of it and really become artistic and enhance the whole thing incredibly, which is, you know, which is, of course, a real skill. Yeah, it, it takes time to learn. And uh, like like anything, it takes time to practice. And uh, practice makes makes it get better every time you do it. Um, and, you know, we, getting things right in camera is important, especially if you're looking for sharpness and you're looking for uh, clarity. Those things are real important to nail in, in, in the camera. And then when you get it home, then you can kind of decide, hey, you know, this is a great photo, but it'd be really cool if there was a giant moon behind it. And uh, <laughs> then you go and do that. Exactly. And, you know, very often, I mean, more often than not, I find that, you know, it's, it's what, I, what I usually say is, you know, I, ha I have to get it right in camera too. I have to get it right for the edit because I already know what the, pros what the post-production steps are going to be. Um, I need to make sure I get what I need for the editing, I need to get that right in camera. So I also need to get it right in camera, it's just in a, in a slightly different way, I suppose. Yeah, I do. It's a, it's a real skill, but of course, what we're going to talk about today is is where, you know, the robot overlords are taking over and artificial intelligence uh, has, has been coming into the game massively over the last, I would say, probably, I don't know, may, maybe over the last year, but it seems like over the last six months, um, it's it's really... Uh, it's really kind of skyrocketed. I'm just thinking about, you know, the uh, the AI that that most people will probably know from the latest Photoshop and Lightroom updates. You know, um, I mean, obviously things like uh, you know Content Aware Frill has been around for a while, but I think most recently, it's like Photoshop has really kicked it out of the ballpark as far as as far as ability of artificially creating, you know, aspects of the image is concerned. Um, how how did you first get into the whole artificial intelligence thing? Yeah, so you know, there's a little story behind that, and that's uh, back in uh, 2000, uh, 2020, when the pandemic hit. Uh, you know, sort of stuck at home, uh, not able to take photographs in my favorite places, and so I uh, I was flying my drone quite a bit and taking pictures with my drone. Um, 
there's only so much you can do with that in the States before people threaten you. So, um, uh, I started playing with an app called Wombo Dream and Wombo Dream made these amazing full color, colorful, um, images that uh, I can probably throw up here and I'll show you what you're looking at here. I'll start. So these are some of my photos from the past years that I've taken some of my landscapes. Uh, kind of give you an idea how I kind of want to draw some fantasy in there. But as I was saying, so in 2020, in early 2021, there wasn't a whole lot of photography I was able to do. So uh, I got this app called Wombo Dream and started playing with these props. And these are text prompts. And so you're typing things in. In this case, I was typing in um, uh, rainbow dancing dervish sari or some other, you know, uh, ethnic uh, clothing and was coming up with these amazing very um stylistic images which i thought hey you know these are pretty cool you can do stuff with this i could see i could see taking this and maybe into illustrator and, and recreating them or taking them into photoshop and playing with them but as time progressed um i noticed that there was different ways you could manipulate the app to do different things um so then i think uh in 2021 the dream was creating these really neat stylistic images of, of people and of artistic and uh architecture uh but it wasn't really doing anything like photographic uh and i was really looking for something a little more a little stronger a little more photographic a little more up my alley so to speak as far as it goes um and i found this program called canvas by nvidia um and canvas is runs on windows but there's also a web app called galgan 2 and if you go and you search galgan 2 you'll find the app and it works just by painting on the screen and you tell it what you're painting. For example, in this case here, I'm painting, um, you know, this uh, sort of a field in front of an ocean and there's a road running down the middle of the field. And I'm trying to recreate uh, some images I saw when I was in, uh, when I visited Ireland a few years ago. And I really wanted to kind of recreate sort of that, that feeling, the Irish coastline. And um, sure enough, it does a really good job. And it's producing them at about um, 1024 by 1024. And they're fairly photographic looking, and you could upscale them with, say, topaz or whatever, and they kind of look really good. So what we're what we're talking about here is really sort of the next step from, let's say, you know, like content aware fill or object selection in Photoshop, where obviously the the software or the algorithm figures out, well, there's an object, you know, and I, this is the main subject of the image, and this is what we're going to select, for example. Here we're really artificially creating an image from scratch by telling the app or or the algorithm by using words what it is that we want to see in the image exactly yeah so this is what's called in this case these cases this is what's called in, in the parlance of the of, of artificial intelligence this is called text to image and so you're literally typing in text that you want to see. Um, in the example of the the uh, the second image here on the screen, it's a it's a door, a doorway to another realm in a field of flowers, and this is what it created. And one of the cool things about the text to text uh, text to image uh, generators is that you can use entire sentences. You can add details about what you want to see. I want it to be a door covered in ruins, or I want it to be. Um, a photograph by a certain photographer or uh, a painting by a certain painter. Um, you can come up with all sorts of wild and uh, neat creations this way. Um, the uh, the Will Smith image there, I, I literally just typed in uh, Will Smith Slack into um, Mid Journey, and that's what it produced. Now this was this was still early early 2020, uh, 2022. Sorry, after. After that, there's a uh, sort of a, a massive evolution, just as you as you noticed, in the, just the past year, an explosion has occurred. And what's happened is, is that companies like Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion, uh, Stability AI, and the company who makes uh, Dolly 2, which is Open AI, they've added a lot of detail and information into their uh, their platforms, uh, adding more and more and more tagged images to produce even more realistic images. So back in about September of 2022, both Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion um, released new updates, which rather than creating these kind of cool artistic images, which you might want to play with, actually started creating photo realistic images out of the box. 
and that's so, that's the thing. I think that was the thing that blew that blew our minds like a few a couple of months ago when uh, you know when Delhi, you know Delhi was big in the news. Um, and I, re- I remember seeing some of the some of the photorealistic results, and that just completely blew my mind at the time. Yeah, these these four results here that I'm showing, um, these were all right out of Mid Journey. These were very simple prompts. Um, did a whole series of little action figures, and you can see it looks like a three dimensional object, and it's got depth of field. And again, you tell tell the again you tell the AI what you want to see, and it will produce it. And I was. Uh, starting to composite images together. At the time, I had been asked by Russell Brown, who's the uh, creative director at Adobe, to make some movie posters for it, an upcoming uh, presentation he was going to do at the Adobe Maps class. And so I was looking for uh, pictures of um, stars like Keanu Reeves and these other people dressed as Vikings. And you can literally type in um, someone's name, like Benedict Cumberbatch, and as a Viking, and you'll actually get him dressed as a bike it's it's pretty insane that what you can do with it now yeah. that's incredible i mean i saw i saw your uh series of of photos of like a late night show hosts as like yeah. action figures <laughs> yeah I, I did a whole series i called it i called it real heroes i did little kids as action yeah. figures and then i did a series of sort of late night talk show hosts as action figures because uh, I, I had seen, I think it was uh, Jimmy Kimmel was mentioning that somebody was using his image as uh, as a prompt in, in, in Mid Journey or in Dolly, and they were coming up with some interesting stuff, but it, it wasn't that great. And so I'm like, no, you could do you could do anything with this. Um, but I think most people know that we we're using AI more and more in almost everyday activities, especially within ph- photography and Photoshop. Um, for example, you know, the, the new content aware object selection in, in Photoshop that's using AI to determine sort of the boundaries of things. And then there's, there's applications like Topaz Gigapixel, which are actually able to take an image that's low resolution and blow it up yeah. using, uh, artificial intelligence. And Topaz sharpening as well. In fact. Yeah. Topaz sharpening AI is pretty slick. I love the, yeah. uh, I love the motion blur cleanup because, uh, <laughs> Just when you thought you got that shot and you get it home and you're looking at it, you're going, well, I missed the focus. You can, yeah. you can bring it back pretty good. I, that saved a project of mine recently where one of the critical shots that the client wanted, you know, I looked at it on the screen and I'm like, oh, damn it. That's, it's, it's, it's so, it's so soft. I can't deliver that. And, and then I went like, wait a minute, Topaz sharpening. Let's just give that a shot. And it, I mean, I, I kid you not, I mean, it, it took three minutes i think yeah it, it's pretty impressive what you can do with it yeah i, yeah. I definitely agree that there's it, it's it's amazing i think um you know and just sort of give everybody sort of an overview of what we're talking about because we're mm-hmm. going to start talking about how it kind of corresponds with photoshop and that's really pretty quick um just to kind of give you an idea most of these are using what's called a, a generative adversarial network and it's a pretty straightforward process where you take uh the idea like a camp you take a bunch of images of cats and you just pound in these into a database along with um, uh, sort of tagged information of what you're seeing, what kind of cat it is, what sort of the position it's in, etc. All that information gets tagged together into the database. Um, it's then you take two separate versions of the database and you let them fight it out over once a cat. And the one that wins goes on to continue this sort of process of elimination until you get a better and a better and a better uh, model. Um, and that's sort of what um, Galgan and Canvas use, and it works real well for landscape images and sort of general images. It's not real good on people and that sort of thing. Um, Dolly 2 is using something called Clip, which sort of the same system. Lots of images of critters, lots of images of skateboards. We're going to throw those all into the database, and it's going to go and generate based on that data, what your new image is. For example, you want a cat on a skateboard. Well, you don't necessarily have to put a picture of a cat on a skateboard into the database. You just have to put a cat and skateboards. And it knows how to position the cat. It knows how to do all of this. And it will create the cat on the skateboard for you. And it's sort of mind blowing when you can type in, you know, anything and and get some good results. So. That's sort of the basic, the way how it works. Let's see if I've got anything. Uh, I I should show you this last was last slide here because it's kind of important. So the new method, those are sort of older generative methods. The newest method is what's called diffusion, and that's where we get stable diffusion. 
Um, and this is where you hear the word diffusion. And what this literally means is, and we've all done this, we've all played with this as photographers, at least those of us in Photoshop, take an image and then turn it into just complete noise, right? Uh, just continue to add noise and add noise and add noise to that image until it's obliterated. Well, in this case, what happens is a computer will do this and then it learns to back that image up from the noise back to the original image by adding detail, adding detail, adding detail. And it can generate a brand new cat from other images of cats. So this cat never existed. This cat does not exist. This is no one's pet. This pet, let's, you know, it's, uh, there's some websites out there, you know, this beach does not exist or this person does not exist. Well, this cat does not exist. Um, it's a completely generated creature. Um, and it's, it's based on this diffusion method. So that's how mid journey and stable diffusion kind of uh, work together. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of AI imaging and, and how it works. We can probably uh, talk some more about other aspects here. Yeah, I mean, what's what's interesting is I mean, you mentioned that um, a lot of those uh, algorithms or AIs really base uh, you know base their uh, the methods on um, you know a, a vast array of of imagery, like millions or even billions of, of different images that are being tagged and it, it analyzes those. You know, where does it get those images from? So, uh, as a lot of people may have noticed, sometimes if you're using this uh, one of these AI generators and you type in an image, you'll actually get an image and you'll actually see watermarks um, sort of faded into the image. And so it tells you that it's pulling them from the internet and it's pulling these images um, and the information tag a lot of times directly from the internet. And there's an options here, but just for just for general, most of them are you pulling them directly from the internet or from a uh, a sort of a uh, collated database of, of images that are tagged and ready to go. Um, it definitely has in the past um, slanted towards uh, royalty-free images on the internet that had you know watermarks and stuff, and you could always pull them up with watermarks. Um, but kind of to give to give some clarity, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, you know, rather than if if you and I wanted to composite an image together, we would take different images from different people and we would cobble those images together in Photoshop. And the original photographer might be able to go back and go, hey, that's my cat or that's my, you know, that's my bicycle and you've just composited it into your image. Well, these are not really doing that. And it's and it's a clarification I think that's important because there's some artists and there's some photographers out there who feel like they're or the work's being sort of stolen for this project these projects. And to some extent it is, but it's as if, and, and there's a lot of caveats here, but it's as if I was to buy all of the photos in the world and place them on my wall, decide which ones I wanted to simulate and then create my own image based on those. So you don't really, you're not really copying the image or the styles per se. Um, so it's not like there's, there's elements of the image your image in this image it's a completely new and original image utilizing the style that it's that you've asked it to do so it's 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 a quandary but it in and, and there's definitely ethical issues here but just sort of cut off the copyright issue right there i'm not okay. talking about copying someone's property it's i mean it's i think you could probably liken it to if you went to an art gallery and you studied all the you know the great painters of the past and then you you take that knowledge, you've been looking at all of those images and all those pictures and paintings, and then you go and you create an image in the style of Dali, let's say, for argument's sake. I think that's probably a similar a similar thing because you haven't really you haven't stolen anything, or you haven't like you know, nicked any, anybody. You haven't nicked you haven't like stolen Dali's painting, um, but you just recreated something in that style. I can imagine that stock photography in the future will be more of a thing where it you literally just generate artificially generate the image that you're looking for. Like let's say if it's like, you know, I don't know, um, sunrise over the Buckinghamshire countryside with mist on a winter morning or something like that. Yep, I, that's how sort of this starting to melt for me um in doing posters and images for the adobe max class for russell brown um 
I was wanting very specific images. I wanted a sort of Norwegian forward, the snow on the top with sort of water, you know, at a certain level. And I was having a real hard time going through Adobe stock looking for those images. And I didn't find what I was looking for. So I, on a whim, I decided to go into uh, mid journey, just type in the prompt. And I started getting amazing images right out of the box. And I'm like, this is perfect. I'm ready to go. I just needed to upscale them a bit and then throw them into the posters. And so I provided all of those images to the to the people who attended the class to use in their own in their own images. And so we created all of these movie posters using those images, and uh, it turned out pretty good. Um, I also did create a whole series of you know uh, Hollywood stars dressed as Vikings, and then composited them together as well. <laughs> awesome, that's wicked. I've got to tell. Um... I always thought I always thought that Brian Cranston would look great as a as a Viking king with a big orange yeah. helmet. <laughs> awesome. They should they should reshoot all of Breaking Bad just like that. <laughs> I, I'm all for it, man. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, um, yeah. Breaking Bad in uh, eight hundred AD. <laughs> Love it. Breaking really bad. <laughs> yeah, breaking really bad. <laughs> oh man, I've got to I've got to talk to uh, Dave Williams about this because he's uh, you know he's he's embarking on a on a trip to. Uh, to the Arctic to take to mainly to take photographs. Um, all of that might be, you know, it might be unnecessary in the future. You can just generate them. <laughs> yeah, but who wants to freeze themselves to death? Just just generate them and, and say, I went to the Arctic and yeah. here they are, right? Exactly. You can even add a polar bear here or a penguin over there, depending yeah. on which which side which side you're on. Yeah. Yeah, and he can put he can copy okay. himself in. It's just as, as proof that, that he was there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some some pretty amazing things you could do with this. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that would be that would be useful. And it's been good seeing Dave at the uh, Adobe Max and getting getting to know him and work with him on on the project. Yeah, uh, he makes a pretty pretty compelling Viking too. So all dressed up, I've got pictures of him in full makeup and gear, all ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I saw I saw some of that online. Um, I have to say, uh, yeah, I like the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, I saw well. I saw him um, just after he got back from Adobe Max, and he still had the hair. So, yep, yeah, I uh, he he looked uh, he looked pretty good. So it was it was good seeing everybody there, and it sort of it was a great springboard. He was able to produce a lot of different things. So let's see if I have. I might be able to bring up one of my posters here from the Adobe Max class and kind of give everybody an idea what we're talking about. Um, yeah, so the, the whole project was really uh, based around Vikings. But the, the saga of yeah, the source, so, is what it was, yeah. Yeah. So every year, um, we do a different, uh, sort of a different theme. Um, we, you know, we did a Japanese theme. We did a manga anime theme. We did sort of kaiju with giant monsters. Um, we did Hollywood monsters one year. So this year, um, we wanted to kind of go with something that wasn't uh, too ethnic in some way and, and go with Vikings. Uh, the last time I went, we did. Uh, Aztecs and Egyptians, and they, they really mesh real well, sort of a day of the dead. Um, unfortunately, some people weren't, weren't overly thrilled with that, but uh, I, I really enjoyed that. I thought it worked real well together. But this year we decided to go with Vikings, and uh, here's a composite image uh, I did with the Vikings, uh, Russell Brown there in the center. But just so everybody knows, everything except the people in this image is AI generated. The background, the waves, the rocks, all of that is generated with, with AI and then composited into this image. Um, and it, it worked really good. And I've got this poster hanging on my wall and it's it's a huge, you know, 40, 40 by 30 image. It's a very yeah. large poster. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems it seems like you know, AI really is the future when it comes to compositing, um, you know, in general, I think. Yeah, I think there's, a, I think there's gonna be a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of advancement and in talking with the Adobe engineers this year at Adobe Max, and I have to be careful how much I say because I think some of them are still under NDA, but they're taking a very slow measured approach. Um, and they did mention during the the uh, Adobe Max keynotes that they were taking a very slow approach to this, um, considering the ethical issues that were involved. Um, one of the things that they were talking about is they were concerned that they wanted to make sure that people could tell what was a real image and what was what was generated. Um, and, and I see this as an issue coming up, as you know, in, here in the U.S. and probably, you know, just about everywhere, there's, there's sort of an issue with fake news going on. Uh, and 
I was playing with Mid Journey the other day, and you can generate very realistic images, say, from the 1970s of things happening that didn't happen. Um, and so one of my concerns is that um, I, I follow I follow some folks online who sort of debunk UFO experiences, and I'm always interested on how people are, uh, they see an image, and as soon as they see the image, their brain creates a whole story around the image and adopts that story as being, you know, the truth. Well, and, and we've seen, especially in the, in the political cycles in the U.S., we'll, we'll get a 20-second clip of, it, of an event, and we're all basing everything upon that 20-second clip. And that very 20-second clip is a very narrow, ga a narrow view of what happened. We don't see what's going on over here. We don't see what's going on over here. We only see what happened here for those 20 seconds. So it's easy to say in those 20 seconds that this was a bad thing or this was this was not a good thing that happened. But once you get the full scope, you might see, you know, this is not necessarily what happened. But going back to the UFO things, we'll see a picture of uh, somebody recently. There was a, a person who was shooting a, a video through an airplane window. And there's an object that moves across the screen very quickly. And everybody's like, oh, this is a UFO. It's clearly a super fast UFO. Well, what you don't know is that the image was a time-lapse image, that it's probably got night vision on there, or it's, it's a long exposure, and so everything's streaking across the image. Um, and once you slow this image down, you go, that's just another plane about a thousand feet away moving in, a, you know, in the opposite direction. So it looks like it's moving extremely fast. Well, in the same way, I think with AI, um, we're going to be able to generate things that never happened. Um, you can create very realistic images with AI, and and I'm concerned that, and you know, one of the other ethical issues is that we'll be able to generate fake history that will uh, will influence people. Yeah, and that's, I mean, there, there is a moral side to this, uh, and of course, you know, it, that's a discussion that's been uh, that's been sort of going on in, you know, in in photo retouching for quite some time. You know, when we're talking about, yeah. for instance. You know, elongated necks, and you know, changed body proportions, and you know, elongated legs, and all, all the rest of it, um, and the way that that affects children, and teenagers, um, in in the way that they, you know, think of their own bodies. For example, that's been a discussion that's been going on for for a good few years, and and I, I think, and anybody who's listening, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I believe that the EU has actually passed a law that, or at least certain countries in the EU or something have, have passed a law. Um, that basically uh, that basically means that if you know if an advertising if a company uses those kind of advertising images, they need to clearly uh, they made to basically make it clear that this is this has been a photoshopped image. Essentially, that's that's what it is. Um, but I tell you what, before we go into that, I forgot one thing because uh, one thing that I, that we like to do on this show is uh, we like to shout out. Uh, we like to give some listeners a shout out. So this week's listener, that I want to give a shout out to is Britt O'Neill. She sent me a really nice uh, message um, on Instagram, I believe. Uh, she's a portrait wildlife and landscape uh, photographer in Ireland, and had a look at your images, Britt. They're freaking fantastic. Um, I'm going to put the um, I'm going to put your um, Instagram handle in the description of this video. People check that out. Uh, Britt O'Neill, fantastic uh, wildlife images there. Anyway, Britt, thanks for listening. Um, again, if you are listening out there, um, or if you're watching this video and um, and you want to get in touch, you can do that on Instagram. Uh, it's at Camera Shake Podcast. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Although who knows how long for, because we don't know what's happening with Twitter. Um, it's at Shea Camera. Um, you can also hit us up uh, in our Facebook group. If you check out facebook.com forward slash group uh, Camera Shake Podcast. Um, that's really where we have a little community going. So, you know, it's up there. Anyway, Britt, well done. Cool. Um, yes. So, um, where were we? Photoshop retouching. Again, that's, you know, that's been a discussion that's been going on for, for some time. Um, I can see how AI is going to take that to a whole different level. Indeed, yes, I I, I definitely think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of changes. Um, and like I said, I was talking with the Adobe team. I did see some of their upcoming plans, and they are going to be eventually uh, integrating uh, sort of generative imagery in their system soon. Um, there's already some with the neural filters, although yes. it's it's still fairly limited. Um, I played with their, they have a, if you download the beta, they have a background generator, um, which is generative, uh, although I thought it was extremely limited, but okay. it is sort of a, sort of a peek into what's going to happen. Yes. Yeah, so but if people want, go ahead. Yeah. So the, the neural filters, I was going to say, um, I, I find them quite fascinating. They have also improved over the last year or so quite dramatically. Yep. I mean, in fact, you know, I did a, 
I did a job the other day um, where I was reconstructing a black and white photo that was very heavily damaged. Um, and it was, you know, the client had a photo of their, I think, I, I believe it was their grandparent or something, um, which was like a, a World War II photo, a black, you know, black and white photograph. Um, and I, you know, I, I basically cleaned it up. Um, and then I gave them a colorized version of it, which actually was, I have to say, the result was phenomenal. I mean, it, it literally made that, it, you know, it just made that person come alive on that old black and white photo. And uh, I think they were really very, very impressed and taken aback as to how realistic that looked, you know? And I, I remember using... Yeah, it's... Sorry, I, I just say, I, I remember using that particular neural filter like about a year ago and the results weren't by any stretch of the imagination and anywhere near where they are now. Yeah, there's the, there's also in the newest version of Photoshop, there's the Photo Restore, which is is pretty good as far as uh, yes. fixing faces and taking uh, scratches and dust out of an image. Um, I think it's a little aggressive on how it does it, and it, it's really aggressive on the face, and it's less aggressive on the rest of the image. Um, I think as, as time gets better, as time goes by, it's going to get better and better, um, and I, I think it's going to be really useful. Um, yeah, I... I it's interesting though, if folks are interested in getting sort of generative uh, technology in Photoshop now, there are a couple of options already available um, apart from Adobe. For example, there's the um, Stable Diffusion plugin by Chris, Christian Cantrell. Uh, it's a free plugin. Uh, you do have to have an account with uh, Stability AI and with Dolly 2 to use this if you're interested. Um, there's also another plugin by a company called Flying Dog. And it's actually pretty good. They're both actually really good uh, for what they're doing. Um, there's still some hiccups. It's, this is all still sort of uh, cutting edge stuff. So it's kind of fun to use. And I can demonstrate those at, at some point. Um, but if anybody wants to sort of jump into this, you can go right to uh, Dolly's website, which is, uh, I think it's openai.com or to uh, Stability AI's website and and just start playing with it and, and, and learning how this works. And... Think about all the things that you would put into an image, whether it's uh, you know the, the lens size you're using, the aperture that you're going to be using, the uh, the color grading you want to put into the image, whether you want a cool tone or a warm tone, uh, and then everything you want about the image. Do you want it just to be a, a journalistic style, or do you want it to be an epic photo with cinematic lighting? You can add those terms all into your uh, into your text prompt, and you'll come up with some amazing amazing imagery. Um, Mid Journey, which is one of the uh, generative products, is runs through an application called Discord, which uh, maybe folks know, but Discord is a uh, it's sort of a chat application, and it allows you to um, interact directly with the uh, Mid Journey system through this chat application. And as you can see, I've been playing with it a little bit here today. Um, this is a, a fantastic example. So I'm going to tell the the bot to imagine. Um, and let's go, and I like kind of the Dutch angle. It doesn't really get the Dutch angle there, did it? Uh, but we'll just go, let's try an epic photo of, uh, Nor I'm stuck on, I'm stuck on, uh, Vikings, all right, Norwegian. Someone's going to tell you I'm spelling things wrong. Fjord with snow-capped mountains. We'll go, uh, cinematic lighting. We'll go 16 millimeter, 44 megapixel. Now, that doesn't mean it's actually going to make the image 44 megapixel, but it's just going to add extra detail. And uh, detail helps if you spell correctly. And there are other things I can do to this prompt to get certain aspect ratios and that sort of thing, but right now I'm just going to let it run. So Midjourney just upgraded to what's called version 4. And version 4 is a new model incorporating billions of images. And so it's got a very strong uh, image base that it's, it's pulling from. And the images are quite photographic, generally. Now, I could have said painting instead of photo. And what would have happened is I would have gotten a painting, uh, a more painted look. You can even use a specific artist's name as a reference to get it a, a specific style if you're interested. So as you can see, this is our first our first step. This is the first step in creating the image. You can see it's a very blurry. And again, remember, it's taking a blurry, noise-filled image, and it's going to be ever increasing the uh, the steps of which it's going to be generating that image. So now it's gotten even better. 
and even better. And then once it's done, we'll be able to take one of these images and blow it up or all four of them if we want. Here's our finished product. And these are these are pretty spectacular. So I actually like um, I like them all. Well, I'll use this one in the bottom right here. So I'm going to upscale, which is what I'm doing here with this button, this button U4. That's going to upscale this number four. And so once it's upscaling it, it's going to upscale it from the small like 512 by 512. It's going to upscale it to about uh, 1024. But actually, I think it's well, 2,000 pixels by 2,000 yeah. pixels. Um, I can then easily save this drag it into Photoshop and go from there. So for those of you listening to the audio version of this, uh, I highly recommend you hop over to uh, to YouTube to actually, where you can actually see uh, what's going on here <laughs> because it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to watch it generate the images. And with some of these, you can actually save sort of a, a movie. You can tell it to save a movie of the generation process. And you can actually see where it came from. Now, with all of these generative methods, for example, stable diffusion, or Mid Journey or Dolly, there is something called a seed number. And that seed number is sort of the numerical equivalent of what that image is. And you can use that number to generate variations of that image over and over again. But here's my final image um, from Mid Journey. I'm going to go ahead and open it up and save a copy of it. I'm going to save it to my downloads. We'll just go drag that thing into, let me get out of this. This is another image I was working on earlier today. Let's go grab that image. So what we're looking at here is is basically an artificially created image of a Norwegian fjord with snow-capped mountains and a dramatic sky, uh, which, for all intents and purposes, I mean, it really doesn't exist. That's that's the first thing to say. Is right? that's not a place on the planet. Actually, it's just a correct. Yeah. It's a creative. I mean, it's a bit like a painting. I guess. I mean, it's it's a it's a photorealistic interpretation of reality. Yeah, and and keep in mind, you know, I'm I've got certain settings on my mid journey right now that's making a little bit of a painterly look to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of change that so it's a little less painterly and more realistic um, image. We can even tell it to redo the same image in a different format. Um, we can even go back and tell it to use that same image and do it at a specific artist style. So once you have that image, um, once you have that image, what does it say it's called? You're still looking at, sorry, looks like you're still looking at, I don't know why it's called, there we go. So we're going to switch over to Photoshop and you can see I've opened the image in Photoshop now. And now I can even go in here in Photoshop and I can just start compositing it. Um, and if we look and see what the size is, you can see it's a, uh, yeah, 1024 by 1024 in this image. So this is, so I brought the image into Photoshop and you can see, we can go and see what the, the image size is. Right now it's a 1024 by 1024. Um, as time progresses, this is going to get better and better. And of course, I, there's nothing keeping me from taking this and into its uh, gigapixel and blowing it up even bigger. You know, it'll still look really, really good. Um, so that's that's mid journey, and that's sort of the mid journey process. As you go into Discord, you type in the prompt, you get the image out. Um, with Stable Diffusion and Dolly, it's similar. If you're going to use the web, and and maybe we should take a step back to kind of describe that process. There's there's different ways for the user to access these different products. Um, all of them, well, okay, stability. So Stable Diffusion. And Dolly both have web apps that you can access. Um, let's see if I can share the web for this. So it basically it essentially means you go onto the website and all the computation takes place in the cloud, essentially. Correct. So with Dolly, uh, if you go to labs.openai.com and you can type your prompt right here into this box and it will create whatever that image is. Mm -hmm. um, for stability, for stable diffusion, I think it's stability AI. There's several different ones. Um, but yeah, I, I find as far as its quality goes, I find Mid Journey produces right now still some of the best output. Um, and then stable diffusion is a is is just just on the heels of that and then dolly for direct image output i find is sort of behind the pack at this point dolly has a lot of go, a lot going for it one of the coolest things with dolly is the ability to take an image it's already existing and add to it we can take our uh, epic ford here 
And you're seeing my screen okay? So we can go ahead and just add on to this epic forward here. So we'll just go epic photo of a Norwegian fjord. And we can tell it to generate. And it will just add to the image. So this is really useful if you have an image uh, that's, you know, too small and you just need extra extra information, it'll go and generate that information. You just have to describe what's in the photo. Um, and if you give it enough, you can see it's it's just created a whole nother world here. Yeah. And that I can imagine would be extremely useful in something like Photoshop, for example. I mean, I could see how you yeah. know, extending images... Um, that could be a perfect addition. I mean, in my own work, actually, I can immediately see a number of different um, applications that would come in handy there. And it would actually, it would, in fact, it would save me so much time having to, you know, artificially recreate those myself. And so this capability already is in Photoshop through these plugins. Mm -hmm. um, with Stability, the Stability plugin, you can use Dolly to extend the image. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and Flying, Flying Dog also has that capability. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you, for example, Flying Dog bases a, a 512 by 512. Um, I think I can probably get it to do larger. Yeah, we'll do 1024. So we'll go point. Let's just grab this area here. And we'll just tell it to do it. And I'm not sure if this is going to work, so we might have to just cut this part out because it's been it's been a little it's been a little problematic lately. As you can see, I'm typing in "epic photograph of a Norwegian fjord." Um, we can add more details here to the information that we wanted to do. I'm going to have it give me maybe. Four steps, and let's see if it works. So I'm taking this into uh, Photoshop and using the Flying Dog plugin here to generate some more aspects to our image. I've, I've added the prompt, epic photograph of a Norwegian fort, and hopefully this will work this time. We'll see if it comes up and it gets the information. You can tell it's processing right here. And yeah, it's going to add uh, sections to our fjord. You can see sometimes it's adding watermarks and, and signatures already, but um, you know what? This is pretty cool. Let's grab that right there. And now you can see here's our image now. We've expanded the image quite a bit. And it looks, it looks great. We could just keep going. We could add more to it, but you can see how easy that was. So this is the Flying Dog plugin from, uh, it can be called Flying Dog. Uh, not every every aspect is available in each of these uh, plugins, and you're going to have to kind of learn how they work. Um, and we can you can talk about that too down the road if we're interested. Sure, and of course, you know if you're interested in those plugins, then uh, we'll put the links to that in the description um, as well. So the current processes for artificial intelligence image generation are, are shown here. Um, Let's see if I can get this to pop this populate. So text to image. So this is sort of a vocabulary for folks. Text to image means you're taking a, a text prompt, you're typing in the text, and you're creating an image from that text prompt. Image to image. Uh, this is taking an existing image, and then you're adding text to the image to give it a different look. So we're going to change the style of that image by adding the image, telling it what we want to see changed, and then it will do that for us. In painting, which is sort of a... Uh, content aware fix on steroids. Uh, rather than just fixing an image, you can actually add image objects or images into it. For example, if you have a pirate, you want to add a, uh, a parrot on his shoulder, you can do that. Um, and then outpainting, which is what I just showed in, uh, in Photoshop and in Dolly, is where you take an existing image and you can expand the border. So it's sort of a content aware fill or a content aware addition. Uh, again, on steroids, it's, it's a much more uh, advanced version of that. So those are sort of the uh, four different processes that are involved right now. There are more coming as we talk, uh, as we discuss this, there are more uh, advances coming out as we speak. So what text to image is, is you're just taking a text prop and you're creating an image with it. For example, this is an image from Mid Journey and the text prop was high resolution, cyberpunk woman, portrait, neon, lighting, depth of field. And you can see it created this pretty wild image here. Um, 
I can uh, add some details to it. For example, here I've added by Albert Bierstadt. So I'm asking for a painting um, done by this specific artist. And you can see it's created a completely different, but yet fantastic image. And now here's a painting of a high resolution cyberpunk woman portrait, etc., etc., by Titian. And you can see we have a completely different, uh, very stylistic, almost, uh, almost a uh, sort of a almost a, a painted image with uh, yeah. you know, sort of abstract lighting to it. It's, it's got a it's got a nice feel to it. It's yeah. incredible how realistic those look. Yeah, you can get just amazing stuff out of this. Um, and this is Mid Journey. Let's get the hit. So each of the three products, uh, Mid Journey, Dolly, and Stable Diffusion, produce different results. For example, here's a chimpanzee wearing a spacesuit. Um, here's this cyberpunk woman again with three different versions. Uh, and then this is another world very close to ours that we do not perceive directly, but they interact sometimes, painting by Thomas Cole. So you can see you can create sort of abstract concepts within this, and it will generate these images for you. I can already hear the discussions in like Camera Club uh, photo competition guidelines and rules. <laughs> Think... Yeah, in fact, uh, there was a, an image recently that was um, selected as a, it, I think it was in the Denver, one of the state fairs, and they selected an AI created image as their, their blue ribbon winner. And there was a lot of anger about this because it, it, was it wasn't a photograph, it wasn't a painting, it was an AI image. And I think, I think, there's, some, I think there's some validity to being unhappy that an AI image won that at this point because it's just literally typing in and coming up with something. Um, and so you're less of an artist is more of you know, a poet and creating text prompts than you are actually doing anything to the image itself. Um, so I, I think there's power in, in, in using those images for something else. Do you remember not too many years ago, there was, um, there was an image of one, I, I want to say it was a Sony photographic, uh, like competition or something. It was an image that basically was, it showed a, a bit of sky a shot through like an internal staircase, I think. And at the top of it was a plane and it turns out the plane which was perfectly positioned in the center of the image had actually been photoshopped in and there was this big hoo-ha about whether you know the the award should be you know taken back or whatnot um and, and all of that i mean it seems like the incredible child's play now in comparison to what's possible today do you think that we're sort of on the brink of something that's that's it feels very much like you know when film photography gave way to digital and there was this like you know this this massive break in how we take pictures and what we can do with them afterwards and uh, you know in the, in the way that we can manipulate them and also and all that sort of stuff Does it, uh, it seems to I mean to me it feels almost like we're at an at another sort of breaking point like that yeah, I, I especially think it, the speed at which things are moving too I think is, is, is it an interesting interesting thing you know from from film to digital took several years. It took almost a decade to go from you know direct film to usable digital. I remember I was working at a company in the early '90s that we got a, we got a digital camera and its 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 quality was like 320 by 320. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, it, it, it's nice, but you're not going to print this. You're not going to use it for anything. Yeah, um, 1.1 megapixels. And then we went. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and then we jumped. You know, we jumped to 640 by 640. Wow, that's a you know, twice a jump. But that took like two years. Well, with, with AI, we've gone from interesting artistic images to photorealistic images in like 60 days. Um, so I think we're going to see an exponential advancement, a continual exponential adv advancement in this technology over the next couple of years. Um, I think we are going to be to a point where, you know, right now, if you generate a, a picture of a person in Mid Journey or a Dolly, um, it's going to look good. But you're going to see details like they're going to have eight fingers. They're going to have uh, hands that are all squished together. That's that's yeah. the, one of the big jokes is that oh yeah, it's going to take over our jobs, but just shows all these hands and they show. I did I, I, I did experience hand. that because I had a, I had a little play with that earlier myself. You know, as I was prepping for this episode, and <laughs> that's what I noticed. It was very it's a very deformed hands there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's still not quite there. But I think as time progresses, you can tell they'll be able to identify those issues within the the AI and tell it hey. Human beings only have five hands, or five fingers now, five hands. 
human beings only have five fingers and it'll be able to generate exactly five fingers per hand. And I don't think we're too far from that. Um, I think a lot of the naysayers are going, you know, there's, there's, there's no use for this. I think, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of use for this. And I don't think it's going to take the job of photographers. I think it's going to make our jobs, uh, more interesting, especially for composite artists. And for those of us who are, are, are into that already. I think you're going to see more compositing tools sort of filtered into, say, Lightroom. So there's a lot of folks who just use Lightroom. And we already see AI being used, especially in the newest edition of Lightroom, where it's doing the, uh, the sort of constant wear and masking, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen this already. If you go into a photograph of a human being and you tell it um, that you want to do a, a, an advanced portrait in, in Lightroom, it creates all the masks. It creates teeth masks, eye masks, pupil masks um, on the fly. And so it's, it's already starting to filter in. Yeah. And I think as time progresses, we're going to see even more things filter into, say, Lightroom and into Photoshop. Yeah, it's, it's just talking about, you know, the, the face um, or person recognition um, and so face or body detail uh, recognition um, in the latest Lightroom version. I just, uh, you know, I recently shot a, um, like a family portrait session. Um, and I have to say, you know, I kind of I took that as, a, as an opportunity to just see if, I could use that in, in editing and speed up the process. And I can't tell you how much time I've saved. You know, not having to mask things out individually, but just, to, and it was so good. I mean, it was so good. It's, I just couldn't believe it. It was incredible. It's, it saved me. I would say, I mean, I probably retouched about 30 shots, which if you have to individually retouch them, you know, 30 family shots with multiple people in the image, that's going to take you decent chunk of time you know to right. to do that i did the whole thing in probably an hour flat and that's you know that was that was just incredible and then i could go back and watch netflix it was perfect i can remember several years ago at an adobe conference we were watching the keynote and they were showing us um it might have been sneaks and they were showing us content aware feel uh content aware fill and it was the first time they had shown this and demonstrated it for the public and all of us photographers there were just blown away that that we could you know remove objects and people and things from a photo in an instant, and we're all kind of whispering to one another our jobs are you know this is this is the end of our jobs you know people are going to be able to do this themselves well not really um, and the content art feel is good but it's not perfect um, and then you know years later we got uh, you know the, the object selection tool we're all sitting in there watching this object selection tool and you just click a button and your object selected and we're like oh this is this is the end of our jobs. Well, if anybody's used the object selection tool, it's good. It's quite good. It's not perfect. And if you're doing a, a real fine tuned composite, you're going to want to get in there and clean that up yourself. In fact, I find quite often the object selection tool is more of a hindrance because what it does is it ends up going to be jaggy lines on the yeah. person. And I really don't want that. I mean, one of the things about Photoshop in particular is that there are so many different methods of removing just about anything. And it really depends on the situation and the scenario as to which of those methods actually works best or very often it's a combination of those methods that will give you like you know the perfect end results um and i mean that's true for just object removal uh, but it's that's equally true for you know retouching particular aspects of the face for example of the skin you know backs under the eyes there's a there's about 50 different methods as to how you can do each 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 one of those tasks but it just really depends on the image and the situation and the a desired end result that's that's ultimately just the other thing that you as a retoucher you have to think about what is the end result supposed to be what it is for the purpose you know is it going to be you know a, a billboard or is it going to be you know a, a 90 by 90 pixel email signature image and that will very much determine what method and at what speed <laughs> you know you you basically go through uh, go through the retouching that's you know and um but yeah, you know, Adobe's latest tools, both both in Lightroom and in Photoshop, I, I have to say, you know, they they help me as a as a photographer to s speed up the process, and it means that you know I can get through that retouching work quicker. And it from a, purely from a business perspective, it just simply means I can then focus on my business. Actually, you know, for example, and do other things. Or for me. You know, in my in my day to day job, uh, my nine to five job, I do I do graphic design for a uh, a sleep products retailer here in California. 
So we, we, we sell mattresses and furniture and that sort of thing. And one of the things I've had a, a real issue with is finding stock images that are, um, exactly what I want to show. Uh, for example, a lot of stock images will show a nice bedroom, but then there's, you know, some outdated furniture in the picture, or there's a, a an animal or a person on the bed. And I might, I might not necessarily want to show that. Um, so what I've started doing is I've actually started going into Midjourney and Dolly and, and generating bedroom images with just a bed, um, in the editors, uh, or just in a certain aspect. And the great thing is, is that it, it can change the lighting. If I don't like that image and I want different lighting on the image, I can just tell it, Hey, um, change this lighting, use a diff slightly different lighting. I can use the same image and change it. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing tool. And so I see this for uh, photographers and for, for artists, compositors is becoming uh, a very useful tool in the toolbox, like content aware fiddle or like, you know, object selection tools, less than a, a something that's going to ruin our lives. Um, and I think that's sort of the way to look at it. Absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, content of our field is actually a really good example. I mean, I use that literally on a daily basis. Um, and I, re I remember actually not too long ago, I came across, it was probably one of the early Flurn videos or something on YouTube uh, where, you know, which was all about like, you know, object removal and, and how to like remove objects in the background and then repaint a photorealistic, you know, I don't know, street curb or something like that and the amount of work that had to go into that and the amount of time that it took to do that um was just incredible whilst now i just go oh yeah there's just select a thing cut it where fill by you know and you're yep. like it's uh, you know it's uh yeah it's a tool why wouldn't why would you want to use that tool you know yeah and i see ai uh especially this this latest generation and i see when when uh adobe starts to incorporate this into sort of content aware fill I think it's going to be even more powerful because it takes it takes a look at what's going on around it, and rather than just repeating patterns that already exist on your photo, it's going to create patterns that don't exist on your photo or that mesh together with your phone perfectly. And I think that's going to blow us away, and it's going to give us more power in 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 updating things. Um, I mean, we can already select a background and tell it to blur the background, and it looks okay. You know, it's not quite doesn't really quite get that sort of depth of field that we're after. It looks pretty good. Well, with generative tools now, you can tell it to create the same image, but with the depth of field, and it will do that for you. And it will probably nail the depth of field better than you could have done uh, with any other tool within Photoshop. So I see that this tool is coming, and uh, and, and it's here to some extent. Uh, and, and it's it's good. It's a good thing. Um, and it's not something to be feared as much as it is something to be learned about. And, and I'm hoping that as time progresses, Adobe and these other companies will make it much more accessible because right now it's still a sort of techie and you have to be a bit of a geek to get these things installed and running on your system. Yeah. That's because you know Adobe is not the only um, company that that uh, really heavily sort of going into you know getting into AI. Um, uh, Skylum is another thing that's you know that's that's really impressed me. Um, I had a had a bit of a play with uh, Skylum Neo at the at the photography show. And one of the things I really like there, and although I'm not a wedding photographer, but I can see how this is a, is a super useful tool. Um, it's this thing whereby you basically load several thousands of your images into the AI. It analyzes your editing style. And then it basically you know, reimagines your editing style and you know, and, 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 and edits your, your latest, I don't know, wedding that you've shot you know, in your style or in fact, in the style of just about any other photographer that you want to edit in, because that's another right. thing you do, um, you know, and uh, it takes into account your your color grading, you know, the way you pr you prefer to crop, you know, all that kind of stuff, the things that you like to that you typically focus on, and it literally, you know, edits your photos for you in absolutely no time at all. And if you, anybody who's ever shot a wedding, you know, you're you're looking at thousands of images, that you know how much time that takes. You know, and then I'm not saying it's necessarily the the the, the end result is necessarily 100% perfect, but it saves you so much time because all you got to do is go through those images and then make make some final adjustments here and there, and you know, and it, it saves you so much time. You know, we've been doing this actually, you know, for 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 a decade or something with presets in Lightroom, for example. You know, I do that all the time. I create uh, for a particular. Let's take a particular event shoot, for example. I've got let's say 800 images to get through. You know, I, first of all, I create a particular look 
um, that I generally want to achieve across the board with the event that I've shot. And that's that then acts as a basis, but it has all the base manipulations um, baked in already. So I don't have to constantly, I don't know, roll back the reds and you do that on every image. It, it, it basically is essentially as that's created all of those uh, all, all of those settings already and it just saves me a ton of time when I then go through each image because then I really just have to do some very basic things like adjust the exposure you know change a couple of things and then I'm on to the next image so yep. you know we've been using those techniques in a sense forever already this is just the next step indeed and with artificial intelligence the Taking that even to another level, there's a, a new product available called Dream Booth, which is still sort of at a, uh, a more technical level. But you're able to take all of your photos, pump them into the uh, system now, Step Infusion, and output images based upon your style. Um, uh, one of the folks who I was following um, in one of the forums was, he actually works for, I think he works for a company called Rivian, which is a, a new uh, automotive manufacturer. They make these really interesting electrical vehicles. And uh, I'm going to share my screen here to show you what he did. He created images based upon the products that his company uses. And these are all AI-generated images that he created from that data set that he gave to the system. Uh, so these, these aren't photos. Nobody out went out to the woods and actually took those or to the beach and took these photos. He generated these. And, um, you know, they're not quite perfect yet. But you can see the direction this is headed. And... Um, that is kind of scary. I think, um, you know, not, not having to hire a, a photographer and get them on set. I think there is some, some fear there, but, uh, I think there's a lot of potential as well, uh, to save time. Uh, you know, if one of the things I've been doing in my, you know, my artwork, as I was telling you, is I was using some stock photos that, um, they were quite perfect. And I was having to edit them. And so rather than edit photos, I just went into, so these images were generated by Mint Journey. And they're pretty good. Now, the great thing is, in, in Instagram, at an Instagram resolution, you're not going to be able to notice that if you zoom in here, no, nothing that's actually on this table makes sense. <laughs> not, none of this actually is anything you'd actually have anywhere in it. And, you know, so there's some, what's going on with this window, right? But at a quick glance on Instagram or, uh, you know, and social media, you know, if I'm just showing you this much of the image, it's going to work fine. Um, it, it looks good enough at, at a distance. So, so that's that's one of the other cool things I could do with this is that you know, I if I need specific images, I can go and at least try to get them out of the uh, the AI and then edit them yeah. even further than necessary. Fantastic. So where's this where's this going to take us in the future, though? That's that's what I want to know. Oh well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, I actually have a bit of data on that, and uh, I I can show you some of this. Um, and this is actually still uh, two months old, and, and that may not sound like a lot, but in reality, two months in this space is is forever. Uh, what's next? Yeah, what's next? Where is this going? Video. So right now, you're able to take um, a frame from an artificially generated image and basically morph it to another one and then morph it to another one and morph it to another one. As you can see, we can create these pretty uh, artistic images and videos that, that morph from image to image. Uh, we can now take images from uh, these artificial intelligence and then rotoscope them using a product called uh, EBSense. And so we can take a, an actual video and then we can actually take something and rotoscope an image on top of it. So in this case, we rotoscoped a, a, a alabaster, or a painting, yeah. or in the last case here, he's created a zombie. Uh, we, we're seeing a lot of that um, at the moment in, in the form of deep fakes. Yes. And so this is going to get even even more intense because we won't necessarily have to deep fake someone that already exists. We'll yeah. be able to deep fake someone who doesn't exist and create a completely new actor. Um, the next step, of course, is going to be three dimensionals. Well, if you can generate a single dimension of one of these images, there's no reason you can't create all three sides of the image and then even generate an output of a uh, a three dimensional file. So I think I think 
the technology is there to do a whole lot more already. Stable Diffusion 1.5 was just released. Um, it's got mixed reviews, although I think there's a lot of good information there. Um, the in painting model is much better, which means you can select a portion of the image and add to it really easily. Um, the company Stability AI and Runway, which is another company that have worked together, there was some drama between them, but that's all gotten worked out. As I mentioned before, uh, you need, there's several different ways to access uh, these data sets and these applications. There's the web version that you can access, which is pretty straightforward, and everybody can probably access uh, Dolly or Mid Journey or Stability UI through the web or through Discord. Or if you're interested, you can actually get uh, the, the plugins for Photoshop for Stability AI and for Dolly, um, either through Christian Cantrell or Flying Dog, both of which are available on the Adobe Exchange. The last way to actually do this is to go to Stable Diffusion uh, or, or Google Stable Diffusion GitHub. And you can download one of the many. There's a lot of different models of Stable Diffusion that you can download, install on your own personal computer, and run locally. Now, it requires a bit of geekiness and a little bit of programming language, and so that's kind of outside the scope of a lot of folks. Um, but you can generate very quickly images, and it won't cost you anything because you're doing it on your own personal computer. So that's one of the big, the big advantages to being able to install this locally, is that it's not going to cost you anything. Just about every other interface that you would encounter will cost you something. Mid-Journey requires a, at least a $10 a month purchase. Um, for for more than a few images per month dolly also requires credit purchase uh, so there's going to be some some money involved with these if you download one of the open source sample diffusion github versions install it on your computer you can then integrate that into the flying dog application on your own pc and run it through photoshop constantly generating as many images as you want all day long the one caveat to that kind of installation is that you're going to require you to have a, um, currently, an NVIDIA RTX 2060 or better video card. Um, and currently, it only works on NVIDIA video cards. Um, and so I would recommend that you have at least 8 gigs of video RAM. Um, and the more RAM, the better. Because the more RAM you have, the bigger image you can create. And the better video card you have, the faster it'll create. So those are sort of your two, two caveats. Now, they do have Stable Diffusion that will run on M1 and M2 Macintoshes. Um, so you have to go and Google for that specific instance, and you can download that and run that locally. Um, it is fairly slow right now compared to uh, video card, but that's getting better every day, and there are things that we can do to optimize that down the road. Um, so if you're, if you're a Macintosh owner, which most photographers I know are, um, you're going to want to look into either the web-based applications or you're going to want to download the M1 or N2 specific. If you have an older Mac, you're out of luck. You're going to have to use the web-based application yeah. or the Discord-based app. That said, they still provide a very interactive and easy-to-use experience compared to sort of the, the local install. I'm guessing the uh, my 2011 MacBook Pro isn't going to cut it. <laughs> Not going to cut it. In fact, <laughs> you're probably going to grind that thing to a halt just trying. Yeah, yeah well, I think I'm grinding this to a halt just uh just using Zoom <laughs> these days. Yeah, I, you know, my computer, my, my, I'm a Windows user, right. and uh, I have a, a fairly powerful uh, photographic computer with a lot of RAM and a, a pretty massive video card, and I cannot do stable diffusion on it. So I've actually had to buy a laptop, and then I'm actually running the Zoom on my laptop because it actually has a a 3050 with four gigs of video RAM, so it's just enough to run it. Um, I could produce one image at a time, and it's 512 by 512, but they can still do it, so it's pretty useful. So there's one other application that I think folks should know about, and uh, and I mentioned it before, and it's called NVIDIA Gaudian 2. And it's a website that folks can go to, um, and it's also an application for Windows. And uh, I'll show you the Windows application because I think it's pretty phenomenal at what it can do. Um, and this is a bit, an example of what's called image to image um, artificial intelligence. And you can see my screen okay now? So um, it kind of works like Photoshop. We have layers and we have a palette, a panel here. So we can actually select, uh, let's go ahead and create, this is always, this is what I always do. I'm gonna go and I create a, an ocean. I'm gonna grab this little tool right here, which is a line tool. And I'm gonna create an ocean right here. And then we'll go ahead and fill the ocean. 
and look, we already have an ocean sold here. Oh, you know what? This really needs rocks. We really need some rocks. Let's go add some rocks in our ocean. So I'm going to go to another layer. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Those variations. I actually wanted the brush size, which is over here. I'm going to add a layer. And on this new layer, I'm going to add some rocks. And I'm going to paint right here on the image. And we could leave that arch rock there. That's kind of cool, huh? Um, or let's go ahead and fill it and see what we get. So this looks like suddenly we're on the California coast. We can add a layer and we can add some sand We're along this beach here. And we can even go in here and we can add like a little pathway here. And if we wanted, we could put, you know, let's, uh, little puppy clouds. And uh, as Bob Ross might say, how about a little happy tree right here? So you can see just right there, this is image to image. I have a very simple image over here that I've created. And with that simple image, I can create this and then I can just add variations to it. Almost infinite. I can even upload my own photos as I've done here and add variations to those. Yeah, phenomenal. That's pretty substantial. That's phenomenal. I like that. Yeah, that's a pretty good image right there. So uh, these are 1024 by 1024. Um, and this is still technically a beta, even though it's been out for about two years now. Okay. But, you know, as far as AI goes, I just find this so compelling. It's just so much fun to draw on the screen and have it immediately create things. And so you can create wild stuff out of this, like as I was showing you earlier with... Uh, let me keep going creative. A hole right in the middle of our. Yeah, and it's instant. It's instantaneous. Yeah. So this is running on Windows. This is a Windows application, but for Mac users and for folks who don't have enough VRAM, you can go and run this on the web. Just look for Galgan Two, and it'll run just fine on the web. Uh, and it's got some of the same interface. I don't think it's got the layers, but it works just the same, and it's quite uh, quite phenomenal. It's a lot of fun to play with. There's a 360 version. Uh, which allows you to make 360 uh, panoramic images. And then I also read that they're creating a new version, which will actually incorporate um, objects and other things into the system. And it's going to be even better and better. So NVIDIA is working hard on this, and they're really at the forefront. I actually got to talk to the AMD company at the Adobe Max, and I kind of showed them some of the stuff I was doing with the NVIDIA cards and going, hey, guys, you got to step up here. Um, and they said that they are working on uh, similar products down in the future, and we probably will start seeing some connection there soon. You know, whenever okay. something happens in stills photography, I think the next step, and this this comes with sort of you know an advance in computing power and so on and so forth, is you know we see things like that in in the moving image, you know, in video, for example. Um, that'll be, I think that'll that'll be the next. The next step in that, because I mean, we we already you know we already used to um, CGI and computer generated uh, imagery in movies, for example. But this technology will make that a hell of a lot easier to do. Yeah, I can see folks uh, uploading uh, their own styles and images and characters into uh, one of the uh, the engines. And then having it generate three dimensional or having it generate animations of that person doing things. And we're already seeing this if you go on Twitter and you search for some of these animations, you'll start to see them. They're getting better and better and better every day. And as those image sets increase and as that data gets better, um, you're just going to see a refinement of, of that product. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe, maybe somebody can make Princess Leia look more photorealistic than. Like Princess Leia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, see, it's, it's funny you say that. My wife and I, we actually, uh, we've been watching the Andor series, and uh, she didn't remember Rogue One. Right. So we started up Rogue One, and we got to that point, and she's like, you know, that kind of looks like her. I'm like, yeah, kind of, but we could actually make it. You know, I, I was, there was a fellow on uh, YouTube who was doing deep fakes, and he was doing a really nice image test with the deep fakes. But I think with AI now, it would be even better. So Yeah, I mean, because yeah, uh, Rogue One came out in 2016, 2017, something like that. So the technology has, like, you know, it has come on in, in leaps and bounds since then. 
he done it. Yeah, I still remember we, we were watching uh, watching it last night. Grand Moff Tarkin is very computer looking, um, very plasticky. I think it was pretty amazing at first on the screen, um, but I think you know now that it's we've had time to see what else can be done, and still it's very plasticky. I would love to see that redone, just that section. Um, and knowing Lucas, that'll probably happen, but yeah. we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been uh, really into the Endor series. It was a bit of a a bit of a slow start in that series, and then it really kicked off actually. Yeah, my yeah, we were watching it, and I I really enjoyed it because I, I love sort of I'm I'm a big fan of British murder mysteries, and especially the old episodic ones where you know you add an entire mystery in a single episode rather than the you gotta watch eight episodes to get the mystery over with. And I don't mind that, but I kind of like the older ones. So um, for me, watching the Andor is kind of like, oh, I know where this is going. This is great. I love this. And my wife's going, I'm bored. I don't want to watch any more of this. So I said, stick with it. We got to, you know, the third and fourth episode. And now we're, we're hooked. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yeah this exactly the same happened to me. My wife actually gave up uh, probably about after the first episode. She was like, oh, I don't know. She's a big, she's a massive sci-fi fan. You know, I'm lucky enough that I've, I've, married a, I've married a woman who, you know, whenever it's like, Hey, do you want to watch a movie? She goes like, does it have spaceships in it? Yes. Okay. I did. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, great. But yeah, Andor, she was a, she's a massive Star Wars and Star Trek fan, but um, Andor, like, she was, a, she was a bit like, oh, I'm not sure, it's a bit slow. And then, um, yeah, I kept watching, you know, sort of three episodes in, and I said to her, like, like, this is really kicking off. Like, you gotta, you gotta love it. I, I like I like simply the fact that like like Rogue One, it's a very serious series. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, you know Ewok sort of funniness in it. It's it's intended for an adult viewer who's able to follow a long difficult storyline, um, and we don't see a lot of famous people in it. Even though we're hearing a lot, and, and by famous I mean you know we don't have any of the the original Star Wars folks except for you know Mon Mothma and a couple of the others uh, mentioned in there and. I just kind of love. I love the. I also love the fact that in this, the Empire is not the comical, um, at least in the newest movies. You know, the Empire or the Empire, the New Empire, whatever it is, the first you know, order, whatever. They're they're comedians. I mean, they're they're emo comedians, but they're terrible. I mean, it's like a it's like a it's like a Mitchell Webb skit. You know, are we the baddies? I mean, that's how bad they are. You know. Um, but in this, it's like, yes, there's this huge bureaucracy, and it's an evil bureaucracy, but they think they're doing good, and I, I really enjoy that. I, I think it's uh, I think it's extremely well written and well done. Yeah. Have you uh, have you had a chance to see the uh, the series, the the Expanse? Uh, yes. So um, I think I'm one season behind, but yeah, we really got into the Expanse as well. Yeah. Yeah, I I have decided that it is my favorite sci-fi series of all time, and. <laughs> I'm a big sci-fi fan, so that's... I know a lot of people who hate, you know, they, they saw that first season and just, they, they were turned off. But for me, uh, there's a scene in that first season where, you know, they, they've just passed a, an SOS beacon, and the guy decides he has to... He decides that he's going to turn the ship around and go back, and it's going to take him three days to get there. And I'm like, it's awesome. That makes complete sense. And my wife's like, why can't they just zoom there like Star Trek? And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the expense is really uh, it's really cool. My wife actually, incidentally, is a massive fan of the expense as well. So yeah, we we enjoyed that. There's been a few um, there's been a few series um, lately that we've really gotten into, uh, but because you know, it's it, this is a very much a sci-fi household. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, you know, it's it's good and bad. I feel like there's there's good stuff like the expanse and Andor, and then I feel that. Um, there's other stuff that where IP is getting, you know, uh, intellectual property is getting taken and they're they're flipping it and they're turning it into something else. And I'm not necessarily happy with that. I'm not really happy with what's going on with Rings of Power. I'm really not happy with the Wheel of Time series. But, you know, I, I'm old school. I read the books, so I kind of want to see my favorite stuff turned into movies rather than someone else's vision for that book. So, yeah, Rings of Power. It's a different taste. Yeah, Rings of Power was... um. <laughs> I was sort of, I don't know, I was kind of on the fence with it. Um, I thought the first, especially the first episode was cringeworthy. It's like, I, I actually, I almost refused to watch any any further. It's my wife that, that kind of convinced me to carry on watching. It did get better, I thought. You know, once you get over the, like, wow, why is everything so politically correct in here? What's going on? <laughs> like, this is too much, you know? Um uh, yeah, but what I think once you, once you get past that, then and you get into the story, 
then it, it actually does get better. There's, there's, a, there's a funny thing that happens yes. here. Um, but whenever we watch TV here, my, my wife went to film school and uh, she, her thing is script writing. So she comes from the, like, you know, the dialogue and the, the script kind of, you know, that's her, that's her angle. And, you know, I'm a very visual person. So I look at the color grading and the, you know, the special effects and the rendering and like, you know, the, the way stuff's lit, you know, and it's always the same thing. It's always like me going like, wow, look at that. That's freaking awesome. Look at the, look at how the, the backlighting is incredible. And she goes like, yeah, but the dialogue's shit. The like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, yeah, my wife, my wife and I kind of do that as well. I, I especially find, you know, like, uh, like the the last Star Wars film. I mean, all, the the three the three of the newest Star Wars films I thought were uh, uh, cinematic. Cinematically, they were really well done. I thought they were beautiful, but I hate them with a fervor. They were the, the script was terrible. The storyline was ridiculous, and. Um, and, and it just, it, it was, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we're actually like, oh, let's watch this again. And I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't bring myself <laughs> yeah. to do it. It's just too much of a betrayal. Yeah. This, the story lines are really jumbled in this. This is, this, that's the problem with it. It just doesn't make a lot of coherent sense. You know, um, in the original trilogy, there was a sense of discovery all the way through. You sort of right. discovered the universe in a way. Um, uh, the problem with the latest trilogy was that the universe already exists because unlike the, the prequels, which, in my view, looked terrible, you know, because the CGI just really wasn't... I mean, it was great at the time, but it, when you look... I mean, they're like, how old? 25 years old now? 20 years old? Something like that. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah. You know, um, so the, the problem with the, the latest trilogy is just simply that they've, on one hand, they've they've gone back to that rough and ready time in that universe where everything's a bit broken, everything's a bit ramshackle, you know, everything's a bit dirty, which I love. I love that about the original trilogy. The fact that the spaceships weren't clean, where they were like all messed up, you know. Um, and that's that was my main criticism with the 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 prequels. It's like this isn't Star Wars, but everything's new. What the hell's going on? <laughs> you know, this isn't cool. But 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 the problem is is that we already know that that universe because of the the original trilogy and now we're back in there so so it, it's not it's, it's not a matter of discovering that universe anymore now it's a matter of, of storyline and it was so important to have a really coherent storyline um and the, the problem with that is because you've got this ensemble cast of multiple characters you have to you have to basically track these different story arches that need to make sense in the way that they intersect and uh and that was a problem from a from a writing perspective yeah. and that uh, you know and you, yeah. uh, the, the fact that they just dropped in you know old characters like Han Solo and then they kill him off like a few scenes later it just seems like well he was just why was he in there it doesn't make any sense and that happened he was just there because that's who he is yeah yeah and it's just because like oh yeah we, we just get some you know fans of the original trilogy on board with us you know and it was like mm, okay no you know that, that's kind of where I, I, I think that's one of the reasons I think that's one of the reasons Mandalorian and in Rogue One and the Andor have worked so well is because we're exploring a universe we already know, but we're seeing aspects of it that we haven't known, and we're not necessarily having a time. We're not we're not beholden to we've got to show this cast person this time, and we've got to we've got to have this robot say something funny at this time. Instead, it's this is how it would be if this actually happened. And I think Mandalorian. You know, Mandalorian went a little overboard with the cuteness of uh, Grogu, but hey, it, you know, who doesn't love a, a tiny little Yoda? He's great. Um, and then, you know, what? It, yeah, exactly. Right. There he is. I love it. Um, and then with, with Andor, you know, we're seeing, I, I mean, for me, I, I, Andor, I, I'm almost liking Andor more than Mandalorian now, simply because I feel like it. The indoor feels like that could have really happened. That feels real to me. So you know what's really clever about and this is, and this is the thing I love. When I first saw, or when I first heard that they're making Rogue One, when you know, when I first like about two years before it actually came out, there was the first, you know, first news that they were gonna take that part of the storyline, and they're gonna expand on that. And I thought that's genius, because that is the thing. You know, with the rebels, I mean, it's just a throwaway comment. You know, uh, you know, some some rebels have managed to get hold of the plans for the for the Death Star, 
It's a throwaway thing. You take right. it for granted. And then in the original trilogy, the storyline progresses. To take that bit and turn that into an expansion of the of the universe makes perfect sense. It's a stroke of right. genius, but it's actually, it makes perfect sense. And it's it's a perfect angle. That's why, you know, when Rogue One came out and it's, um, it was, you know, we were back in this, in the dirty part of the of the universe, but it was an expansion of it. And virtually none of the, with the exception of Darth Vader at the very end, you know, none of the characters were known in any way, but you just, it was, that, that's where you really rediscovered a side okay. of Star Wars that you didn't know, but it just worked perfectly. Yeah, and I think even, you know, and if we, if we go back, we talk about some of the politically correct stuff, even Rogue One, I uh, not Rogue One so much, Indoor has a clear political message, um, which is that, you know, fascist governments are uh, overbearing and inefficient and eventually fail under their own weight. And and you're seeing that. And I think they're doing a great job of telling us this and showing us this without having to tell us out front and beat us over the head with it, which I feel is is sort of the modern way of doing uh, philography, you know, script writing is, we have to we have to shove this political viewpoint in there, and then we have to make it clear that it's the political viewpoint, and then we got to make sure everybody knows and reinforce the viewpoint. And it's like, guys, you know, we got it the first time. It's okay. And I talk about I talk with my wife about this. I say it's okay if you want to bring this point in organically through the story, but as soon as you have to sort of break out from the story and then give me a sermonette on your on your political point, you've lost. Yeah, latest because you've broken the story. Latest you've, the latest season of Stranger Things. That's all I'm saying. Oh my god! Like uh, that was there. It was never ending. <laughs> you know that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know the same thing. I listen to a lot. I listen to a lot of uh, audiobooks, and I and I, there was one I got about twenty, maybe a half an hour into, and then the the ad the the reader the the author breaks out of the story, has one of the characters basically lecture me on a, a very twenty twenty first century viewpoint. And I'm like, you know, it would have been funny if you had just kind of mentioned it and organically said, these people are together for this reason. Like, I'm happy with that. But the fact that you had to have a character lecture me on your your political viewpoint from this, this is a medieval story. And this is a very 21st century viewpoint. It doesn't, I mean, it's fine to have, but yeah, you don't have to beat me over the head with yeah. it. Yeah. Have you seen the Umbrella Academy? Yes. If it, that's it was exactly the same thing in the latest season, um, the last season, where like one of the characters, uh, you know, s switched from, um, you know, being a being a female character to being a male character. Okay, there was a bit of exposition in the first episode that explained that a little bit. Enough said. Enough said. Yeah. But then it just went on and on and on and on, and like literally every other scene, we were back there, and it's like. And I get an episode four or something. I turn around and to my wife, like, when is this going to stop? I mean, I get it. Okay. But I don't care. I don't care enough of, about it. Okay. You know, I don't have to have that ramp down the throat all the time. I mean, it's, that's just yeah. way over the top. I, 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 I'm just not, you know, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those grumpy old guys and, and it's get off my lawn. But I really feel like, you know, if. I kind of feel the same way with The Witcher to some extent. I love The Witcher. I love the IP. Um, the first couple seasons were rough, but I enjoyed them. Um, and but I see the direction that they're headed. And and um, and, and 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 this isn't even necessarily political as much as it is just script writing. And it's like the books went this way. We're gonna go over here. And and I'm okay with that to an extent because The Witcher has a deep uh, sort of background. They've got the games, they have the stories, there's a lot of fan relationship to it. Uh, the games sort of expand the universe. Um, so it's okay. Uh, but then you, you've broken the storyline in such a way that I can't imagine how you're going to fulfill the end goal of the books from this. And, and the same way I feel with the, with the Wheel of Time. You've broken the story in such a way that I don't really see how that end goal of the storyline is going to get fulfilled by the direction you're headed without firmly breaking what you've created. So it, it's just, it's a different way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, you know, for me, that artificial intelligence is really sort of a, a connection into, you know, the things that I love, the sci-fi. And, um, you know, I, I get to in, I get to create worlds that don't exist. Uh, my my uh, Twitter pick, my Twitter profile pick is now a, a monkey in space, a chimpanzee in space that I created all through AI. And I took them into Photoshop and edited them and expanded it. And, um, so there's a lot of neat things you can do with this that I think that intersect a lot of the photography 
um, and filmography worlds and cinematography worlds. And I, and I see that just increasing as time progresses. And as we were talking yeah. about, yeah, I definitely see, I definitely see this becoming a major tool in, in, in cinematography. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it has this sort of, um, it just reminds me of the holo deck in Star Trek next generation. Do you know, when it, when it first came out, I was a kid when it first came out, but uh, the whole idea of like, you know, uh, having a holo deck and being able to transport yourself into, into any reality you wanted, you know, that was, uh, at the, at the click of a button, basically, and just telling a computer um, what to do. That's really something, you know, I've always, I always thought, like, wouldn't it be cool if, if that would come reality? And in, in a weird way with AI, um, that is sort of starting to happen in a, in, a weird, in a weird way. Because you can see this, like, expanding, you know, going, you know, like we, like we said, it's, it's going from editing still images to, to videos. Before you know it, it's going to be, you know, virtual reality and, you know, whatever, whatever else is happening next. So I can, I can imagine that in the not too distant future, you can find yourself wearing some, you know, VR glasses, you know, goggles, you find yourself in a totally photorealistic world. Yeah. And, and there, there already are uh, VR plugins, uh, coming for stable diffusion. And so people are able to create objects and stuff within the VR world through stable diffusion. So we're getting very close to that. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I was uh, there's a uh, application on Steam that you can get for your PC and you can actually walk around the bridge of the Enterprise and through the entire ship and there's there's portions of the ship and what's really funny is that a section of the ship as you walk into it there's a break in the wall it's actually broken and you look in there and you're looking into the hall you're actually in so you're in the holodeck so it's like you're on a holodeck in a holodeck looking at a holodeck so I thought that was a a pretty cool reference and and I can see that that the AI is going to take over some of a lot of that that potential there yeah. um so it's an exciting time um scary but exciting yeah it's as i say the robot overlords are certainly taking over <laughs> my guy it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show it was incredibly interesting and uh you know and i've, I've certainly learned a lot about artificial intelligence 100 I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh you know our listeners and uh and viewers are going to be as fascinated as they are probably scared by now <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was amazing having you on the show. Thank you very much um, for coming on and talk to us. Well, thank, thanks, thanks a lot for having me on. If folks are more interested in this, I have a, a YouTube video that was made back uh, in October. Um, it kind of covers a lot of the same material. It'll go in depth on a lot of things. It'll really explain where to get some of these products and test them out, uh, what the limitations are for October. Um, that's going to be changing. I'll try and keep that updated as time progresses. Um, I have a feeling that I'll probably have to release a new one in just a few weeks yes. because things are moving so quickly. Absolutely. Excellent. So this is the end of episode 130 of the Camera Shake podcast. Um, and again, if you are listening to the audio version, especially but with all of our episodes, but especially with this one, you know, make sure you head over to YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash camera shake, where you can um, certainly, you know, watch all these amazing AI generated images um, as they appear on the screen. Um, other than that, you know, make sure you get in touch. Uh, head us up on Instagram, um, where else? Facebook, all all of the all of the social media platforms. We're everywhere. Uh, anyway, get in touch. It'd be super awesome to hear from you, uh, Micah. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll see you again next Thursday. Bye.